Good afternoon, everyone. It's the first day of June and a very warm Wednesday, and welcome to all of you uh, to Missouri Auditorium and to those who are watching remotely on the web. We have a treat today in terms of our Wednesday afternoon lecture series, that being Dr. Howard Chang, who's going to talk to us about genome regulation by long non-coding RNAs. Uh, Howard got his undergraduate degree at Harvard, his MD-PhD uh, at Harvard and MIT with his PhD component uh, serving under the mentorship of no less than Professor David Baltimore. Uh, after that, he moved uh, to Stanford where he's been in the Department of Dermatology since 2004 and currently serves as professor uh, as well as director of the Center for Personal Dynamic Regulomes. How would you like to be the center of the Personal Dynamic Regulomes director? That's a pretty cool title. Um, he has been honored in many ways by uh, recognitions, including the Paul Marx Prize uh, for cancer research last year. And his work, which I'm sure he's going to tell you about, relates to a fascinating and somewhat unanticipated feature of the human genome, the existence of large numbers uh, of long non-coding RNAs whose existence uh, was not entirely anticipated, at least not in the numbers uh, that they are now clearly represented in the human genome and whose function uh, has been the source uh, of many people's interest over the course of the last decade. And I think no one has done more than Howard to begin to elucidate uh, what the functions are of these particular important nucleic acids. So please join me in welcoming to the podium uh, Dr. Howard Chang. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Collins, for that kind introduction. Thank you to Dr. Tyson for bringing me here. And um, I want to tell you today about uh, long non-coding RNAs. And my talk will be in three parts. First, I'll give you an overview of the field. Second, I'll tell you about some new progress looking at the long non-coding RNAs involved in sex. And third, I'll talk to you about the evolution of long non-coding RNAs. Okay. So the new century started with a, a biological mystery. As these sequences were rolling off our sequencers with the completion of the human genome, uh, we had these vast array of uh, transcripts, and that quickly showed that there were two flavors. One set, which were the classic protein coding genes, behaved very well. You can put them into the computer and quickly realize what kind of enzyme domains, what kind of functions they may be, and off you are to a, a fairly intelligent experiment. But on the other hand, there were these large numbers of transcripts which ultimately got named long non-coding RNAs, which I'll pronounce the abbreviation as link RNAs. So these are transcripts that are defined to be greater than 200 nucleotides. They're made by RNA polymerase II. They're tapped. They're spliced, sometimes polyadenylated. And they appear not to have conserved open reading frames. And so their function, if any, was a large mystery. And so um, the active questions in the field were, uh, do they have any functions? Could they be involved in human disease? And finally, the long-term goal, how can we systematically decode the information content so we can actually understand function from the primary sequence alone? So as we go through this journey, uh, I think that the challenge we face at a time may be analogous to another scientific mystery, one maybe some of you are familiar with. So what I'm showing you here are, is uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, the meaning of which was lost uh, for many years until Napoleon's soldiers found this tablet, uh, the Rosetta Stone, which had the same text written three times, once in hieroglyphics, once in Egyptian, and once in Greek. And by systematic correspondence between these three texts, uh, the, 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 the archaeologists were able to work out this code of transformation and so breaking this code then allowed uh, this text, not only this text to be read, but also all the ancient texts written in hieroglyphics. So this analogy is, I think, very apt for our task because RNA, like uh, these hieroglyphics, fold into complicated shapes. And really our job is to systematically associate form with function. And that's what I'm going to be uh, telling you about. Okay. So in my lab, we've been pursuing uh, potential functional link RNAs by discovering uh, novel link RNAs by their patterns of expression, they're in cancer or disease states, understanding their functions on a molecular level or actually better in vivo, 
And finally, uh, making technologies, tools to define key features in the link RNA and their associated partners, nucleic acids or proteins, that define their function. Okay. And so our foray into this field started from um, my clinical interest, and that was understanding how cells in different positions of the body acquire their positional identity. And I was interested in that question in the skin. So if you look in the mirror or look around, you'll see that skin, even though it's the largest organ that covers your entire body, is not the same everywhere. Some of us have long hairs on our scalps, but I hope none of you have long hairs on your palms and soles, even though it is one organ. So clearly these cells know their location in the body and know how to behave. And so we're interested in the mechanism, the positional memory and genes that will be expressed in a very position-specific manner. Now, in our analysis, in the search for such genes, we use a tool, novel at the time, called a tiling array, and this led to the initial discovery of a copious amount of these link RNAs that had a position-specific expression. And also, in our initial analysis showed that uh, these link RNAs did more than what people uh, suspected. So in the past, a few link RNAs were known, and we're going to talk to you much more about this, such as uh, exist, involved in dosage compensation on the X chromosome link RNAs involved in imprinting, and those always acted on the neighboring genes, that is, in cis. Uh, and they would recruit uh, chromatin remodeling factors, as shown here. And the RNA that we discovered, called hot air, which is expressed only in certain positions uh, in the body, actually turned out to act at a distance. Hot air would bind to a chromatin remodeling complex called polycomb and target polycomb to hundreds of sites throughout the genome, so action at a distance. The function of hot air in the animal was revealed uh, when we knocked out hot air, and which showed then this kind of a birth defect, a homeotic transformation. On the left, I'm showing you uh, basically CT scans of the spine, showing the morphologies from the L1 spine all the way to L6. This L6 spine has these two lateral processes. This is the sacral S1 spine. The iliac crest is joined here. In the hot air knockout, there's a change in positional information so that this last segment, the L6, has been turned to S1. And so you still see the, the two uh, uh, sp uh, spines here, but now the ALEC crest is joined one level above. And so this transformation of identity is due to a deep repression of Hox gene activity. These are found in the transcription factors whose expression determine segment identity. And so in the hot air knock, I would see expansion, for example, of the Hox D10 expression domain and increased expression of Hox D11. And hence, one of the normal functions, we believe, of hot air in the body is to maintain uh, the positional identity, to maintain the positional information. So it turns out that this process, this mechanism, could be subverted in disease. And this was very clearly shown in the case of cancer. A few years after the discovery of hot air, uh, my lab found that uh, in early human breast cancers, approximately a quarter of the patients have very high levels of hot air and high meaning 250-fold or more above normal. Those patients then had a much higher risk to develop metastasis and eventual death from their disease, as shown in this Kaplan-Meier survival curve here. So this is RNA, link RNA is a very powerful biomarker, a very powerful predictor of patient prognosis. So it turns out that hot air is not only a biomarker, it's actually a driver of metastasis. If we take human cancer cells, program them with the level of expression of hot air seen in patients uh, and introduce them into the animal model. As you can see here, these cells are now much more able to metastasize to the lung and cause the disease progression. So the overall idea is that uh, this is a system that normally dictates positional identity, and cancer cells basically subvert the system to convince themselves, to reprogram themselves to think they belong somewhere else in the body. And by this process, they can access the genetic mechanism uh, to spread. So since that time, high levels of hot air has been shown to be a, a poor prognosis factor in 26 different human tumor types, and that there are now actually FDA-approved uh, diagnostics based on link RNA for cancer prediction diagnosis first in 2013. So it's a very active area of investigation. Now, the way we come to know how link RNAs would act was by actually mapping uh, where they would actually interact uh, with the genome. And so here we we're inspired by chromatin immunoprecipitation, chip assays, which were used to define protein DNA interactions. And so the analogous technology uh, we developed was named CHIRP, where the R stands uh, for RNA. This is a technology where we can take living cells, cross-link the chromatin and the RNA together, 
retrieve the RNA of interest with all of the nucleotides that are complementary to that RNA, and then retrieve the associated DNA or proteins, and it's, which is going to be subject to deep sequencing or mass spectrometry. So this technology showed us that hot air indeed co-localizes and guides polycomb occupancy. And in fact, the RNA goes first, and that the polycomb occupancy depends on the RNA. Uh, there is a specific uh, sequence motif that's enriched at hot air target sites. And so there's an interdependence between the RNA and chromatin remodeling factors. And it's important to point out that uh, many of these chromatin remodeling enzymes uh, actually lack intrinsic DNA binding specificity. And hence, uh, these RNA can serve as one of the guides to take them to specific locations uh, in the genome. So extending beyond that idea, we later found that the RNA, a link RNA, can do uh, actually more than one job. Early in embryonic development, uh, histone modification, uh, histones would actually have both two kinds of modifications, one indicating activation, such as histone uh, lysine 4, K4 methylation, and also one indicating silencing, uh, called K27 methylation. So the presence of both markers is called the bivalent domain, it's a poised state. We found that hot air actually acts as a scaffold uh, by interacting with two different enzyme complexes. The five prime end of hot air interacts with polycomb, shown here, and the three prime end interacted with a lysine demethylase, the LSD1 complex, which then removes the K4 methylation. So these two actions together, one removing K4 and one placing the K27 mark, would then enforce a univalent, very strong signal for silencing. And also then shows the logic of how a modular link RNA organization can drive enforced proximity and targeting. So summarizing many sort of studies now in the literature, we now know that link RNAs don't have a single mode of, of, of action. They actually have several uh, link RNA mechanisms. But they can be understood by pairwise combinations of link RNA, protein, and nucleic acid uh, interactions. Some link RNAs act as guides, as I just showed you, taking histone modification complex to specific locations. The uh, part of the RNA dictates the targeting, and the, actually the cargo dictates the effect, either activation or silencing. So this modular design is also now frequently used in design, designing, for example, CRISPR-based uh, guide RNA, uh, synthetic guide RNAs. Other link RNAs uh, can act as a scaffold, and that is bring multiple enzymes together for in, uh, basically proximity to each other or in, uh, joint targeting. Yet other link RNAs literally link three-dimensional uh, chromosome conformation, taking uh, basically enhancers to their target sites. And finally, when the regulation uh, is done, uh, there are other link RNAs that act as decoys. Uh, they can actually be expressed, they bind to a factor of interest, and then move it away from the genome, uh, basically terminating uh, gene regulation. So these kinds of molecular mechanisms were very exciting, and they were quickly then followed by, I think, very nice examples from actually genetics demonstrating the functions of uh, link RNAs. So what I'm showing you here is a, a very nice collaboration between my lab and a lab at Carla Kirkgaard at Stanford, where a link RNA was found to be responsible for a genetic locus involving infection control, but from a purely forward genetic approach. So to keep the story uh, kind of straightforward, there are two strains of mice initially characterized at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. One strain would get infected by certain organisms, and they would all die. One strain would get infected, and they would all live. So it's a very simple phenotype. And so people are trying to, would then perform forward genetic crosses, trying to map down the locus of interest. So this project went on for about 10 years, and it was a really hard project, because when people kept mapping down the locus, there was actually not a protein coding gene there. Okay, so this was very discouraging for, for the people involved until finally, I think, the concept of link RNAs came around. So the locus in question was here in mouse chromosome 10, uh, shown here, and in, in humans in chromosome 12, right next to interferon gamma and number of cytokine genes, and also variation, uh, genetic variants in this uh, location were actually a main, as one of the major hotspots of uh, pr uh, basically proclivities or a number of human diseases shown on, on the graph, uh, and this actually infects intron, uh, the last intron of human nest. This is the name of the link RNA that we eventually uh, gave uh, this locus. So it turns out that this is a defect in a link RNA called nest. Nest is needed uh, basically to activate interferon gamma uh, through actually activation of K4 methylation, uh, and the formal genetic proof came from a transgene encoding NEST was able to rescue uh, basically the deficiency phenotype, uh, showing that this is in fact um, 
uh, the gene responsible. So I think this uh, example nicely demonstrated that natural variation in linked RNA activity can confer disease susceptibility. So what are other ways in which um, basically our sequence or information in linked RNAs can be altered to affect biology? What we learned is that there are actually another class of uh, variants uh, which change RNA structure. And so these have been named ribosnitches. Uh, ribo, because it's RNA, and S, and S is supposed to be a SNP, but it's a snitch because it changed the structure. So this came from our analysis of the heritability of RNA structure, uh, looking at, for example, this family trios. And we can then see that whenever, uh, when, when this allele was in this pattern with an A, this is the shape. And if this position was a C, then this is an alternative shape. So such ribosnitches that change RNA structure are a minority, of course, of all the SNPs. But actually, in fact, uh, we discovered that many of the disease-linked non-coding variants were actually ribosnitches. And that provided a, a potential mechanism for these orphaned uh, variants that had previously lacked a biochemical explanation. More recently, we found that another way to change a link, a non-coding RNA meaning without actually changing a primary sequence is through RNA chemical modification. What I'm showing you here is basically the most prevalent uh, RNA modification called N6-methyladenosine, or M6A. What we discovered is that whenever this modification was placed, it caused a double-stranded region to actually spring open into a single-stranded region. The biophysical basis of this is that every place where this M6A is placed causes a steric clash if you force it into a double-stranded conformation. This has the consequence of destabilizing RNAs if it's at a certain position and allowing their timely turnover. So embryonic stem cells, what we found when we knocked out the M6A uh, writer enzyme was that the M the, these cells would basically get stuck as embryonic stem cells. They could never exit the stem cell state. The reason is because that they cannot forget the past. They cannot turn over the transcripts encoding stem cell fate and therefore they can never actually embrace the future of the new phase in differentiation. So this concept then led to the idea that these modifications would be a kind of anti-epigenetic mechanism, a necessary process for cells to forget. Uh, this mechanism, we believe, would also have implications in cancer. When we basically create, took these cells and injected them into animal models, we see that these uh, cells are incapable of forgetting the past. These metal three knockouts form these huge tumors that was even bigger than the, uh, the entire slide, and they're very primitive cells, reflecting their uh, stem cell origin. So extending along this concept of changes in structure, changing meaning, our latest set of findings have to do with the idea that RNA helicases could actually act as transcription factors. This sounds very uh, strange, but this reflects really the intimate connection between regulatory RNAs on chromatin. And hence, if you want to change information on chromatin, you can actually use an RNA helicase that would occupy chromatin just the same as transcription factors, but would actually change the meaning of the RNA and therefore change the outcome in gene expression. And so there are two examples that uh, we, we came across. First example, all in the last year. First example uh, is uh, an RNA helicase called DDX21, acting on RNA called 7SK and affecting the transcription of ribosome uh, protein genes. So this is actually the binding pattern of DDX21 looks very much like a transcription factor. The second example was a, another uh, helicase called DDX5, working on a link RNA called RMRP, which is critical for making a kind of inflammatory T cells called TH17, and actually very, very necessary for uh, basically um, a disease progression in certain models, for example, of colitis. Okay? So this is a very interesting sort of flow of information where we start from a protein, to an RNA controlling DNA, essentially reversing the sort of the, the canonical dogma of the flow of information. Another surprise uh, from the link RNA world. Okay, so I would like to now change gears a little bit and focus my talk on a, a, a you know I think really a classical link RNA, uh, and I hope I'm allowed to use the government network to, uh, to 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 show this. But I'm showing, of course, uh, two famous Americans, uh, two icons, uh, and you can see that in this. Uh, and so they're both actually showing a dance move called Brush Off the Shoulder, okay? Uh, but you can see that this uh, high-impact journal happens to be really focusing more on her and not so much on our commander-in-chief uh, because you know, she, he's kind of out of the picture here. But um, perhaps this is all appropriate because only Beyonce has a very powerful epigenetic system, and that is 
the X chromosome inactivation. Okay, so of course, <laughs> all of you know that this is a very special process. So let me just remind you, of course, that males have an X and a Y chromosome, and females have two X chromosomes. And to make the gene expression dosage equal in mammals, one of the two X chromosomes in females is epigenetically silenced. This is achieved by a long non-coding RNA called exists that's transcribed only from the inactive X chromosome. It somehow spreads across the entire inactive X and basically causes a permanent epigenetic silencing for that cell and all of its progeny. So this is a very classic example of uh, uh, based somatic cell uh, genet uh, epigenetics. Now, it's important to know that some genes escape X inactivation, and so therefore that causes a fundamental dosage difference between males and females. So one of the ways that we've start now started to study this problem is using a new technology uh, for access basically uh, the regulatory landscape in the genome. And this technology is called ATAC-seq, or assay of transposase accessible chromatin. So I'll briefly explain. This is a technology that my lab and the lab of Will Greenleaf at Stanford invented a couple years ago. And essentially, you can think of it as spray painting the genome uh, with an enzyme. This is a um, transposase, which is an enzyme that copies and pastes DNA. And we've loaded this enzyme uh, with adapters, sequencing adapters I use for sequencing. And the idea is that uh, in humans, in, in mammalian cells, in all, every human cell, two meters of DNA is packed into a 10 micron nucleus. So most of the DNA is packed away and not accessible. Only the active regulatory elements are accessible and hence can be spray painted or tagged by our transposase. So in a single step, you biochemically covalently inserted the tag into the desired locations and then you can just amplify and sequence. So this technology allowed a million-fold improvement in the sensitivity and a hundred-fold improvement in the speed of conducting this type of uh, epigenomic studies. Let me show you some primary data. So this is looking at a particular location in the genome. The x-axis is basically a different location of different genes. And the y-axis indicates each of these peaks indicates an accessible element. Okay. So this is the classic technology DNA hypersensitivity done with 10 million cells. Each of these peaks uh, is an active element. This is the first version of ATAC-seq, 50,000 cells. You can see the pattern looks identical. And last year, uh, we think this technology went to its ultimate resolution, single cell ATAC-seq. This is now the, uh, the, the summation of several hundred single cells, again, reproducing this uh, beautiful pattern. What is nice now is that if you zoom in on this data, you can actually now see uh, the variation at the single cell level, every row here at the bottom is an individual uh, cell, is a single cell. And so for every position in the genome, we see either zero, one, or two reads because it's a diploid genome. So this analog kind of uh, information has turned into digital data uh, from this kind of analysis. So using the kind of technology, we recently surveyed the individuality and the variation uh, in the regulums of healthy donors in CD4 positive T cells. So we found that uh, in these healthy donors, and with, this is a longitudinal study, so we have these same people come back again and again, and we're looking for sources of variation. And you can see that basically a vast majority of elements, I would say 90% plus, you know, maybe 95% or so, were actually quite stable. Only a minority uh, were varying across individuals. But among these, we can then map to different demographic factors that we can associate. And to our surprise, or perhaps not, we found that the, the most significant factor was actually the sex of the donors. And this pervaded through all the sex chromosomes, but also the autosomes. So it was initially a surprise, but as we read more, we realized that there's actually a very strong literature and epidemiological data connecting sex and differences in the immune system, particularly autoimmunity. This is a graph showing the sex preponderance of different diseases. Uh, you can see there's a very, uh, here females is marked blue. You can see there's a very strong trend here. Uh, you know that 80% of all patients with uh, autoimmune disease are women. And some diseases like lupus, the ratio is more like uh, 9 to 1. For Sjogren's, 19 to 1. And so sex chromosome changes have long thought to be postulated. But the actual elements involved right, and the mechanism uh, were actually uh, still, still under investigation. So let me show you some data of a sex-specific regulome. So if we say, for example, look at an autosome, comparing all male attack seek data from human and all female attack seek data, we see actually a very nice 45-degree diagonal, meaning that they're essentially very similar, okay? But if we do this on the X chromosome, we see a very interesting three 
different patterns. In the gray spots are all the elements that undergo X inactivation, so they're dosage compensated. So again, female here, male here, so they're now basically on a slope of one, even though females have two copies of the X chromosome. We see a second regime of elements that have a slope of two, shown here, and these are all the elements that escape X inactivation. So we basically rediscover the ones, uh, the elements, the genes that are known to escape, as well as identify new elements that escape, which we subsequently validated. Thirdly, we have, to have a, a set of elements that have an infinite slope, and they're only present in the inactive X chromosome and not present in males. So that includes exists and several other elements. So this was a nice start, okay? But in these human cells, we can only infer the escape by the dosage of two copies versus one. It definitely does show that the ataxic data is very sensitive, precise, to be able to tell that apart. But we want to directly visualize the two copies in the same nucleus doing something different. And so to that end, uh, we, go on, we went on to a mouse experiment where we can actually follow allele-specific information. So we're looking now at an F1 mouse coming from a cross from two highly divergent strains, shown there, 129 and Castaneus, where we have a presence of a single nucleotide variant approximately every 100 uh, base pair. So when we do attack seek, not only do we have the ends, where the transposis is accessible. When you sequence in, you simultaneously genotype the allele that you've inserted. And so therefore, you can have allele-specific information, and you can track paternal versus maternal regulome in any cell type. Okay. So this is, of course, a technology that's very suitable to study also human variation, uh, disease-associated disease SNPs, or cancer variants, and so forth. Okay. So now, um, X inactivation uh, co-occurs with differentiation. So embryonic stem cells, this is the entire X chromosome. In embryonic stem cells, we have two active X chromosomes. Here's the Castaneus allele, here's the 129 allele. But when they differentiate, now one chromosome stays active, and the other chromosome gets shut down, and it loses globally accessibility, except for these peaks, which are all the escapees. So this high-resolution map uh, gave us now really the detailed information of how these elements escape. And I'm going to combine that with another technology called chromosome confirmation capture, which maps basically the spatial proximity of DNA elements that might be far apart in the linear genome, but when they come close together in space, can be captured and sequenced. So the way to look at this map is that uh, this is basically the coordinates of the chromosome again from left to right, and then again uh, basically from top to bottom. And so the diagonal is the element interacting with itself, and then these off-diagonal squares are long-range contacts. And I'm showing you four, three different viewpoints, the whole chromosome, uh, you can see the whole, uh, basically uh, the active X chromosome in here, uh, across the whole chromosome, and then uh, basically a 100 megabase scale. So you see these, uh, uh, these, each of these blocks are approximately uh, megabase. These are the topologically associated domains, long-range contacts. And in a further zoom, you can actually see individual uh, enhancer promoter contact points. That's on the active X chromosome. Then on the inactive X chromosome, we see something completely different. Now, the entire chromosome has been segregated into two large megadomains, okay? So there's now extensive long-range contact across the entire chromosome. The, the TADs, the topological associated domains, have been removed, so they no longer exist, and instead, uh, it's replaced by this kind of a bilobe uh, shaped pattern. What we further discovered is that this boundary element occurs at this repeat called the DXZ4 repeat, and that this long-range contact has a logic. When genes escape X chromosome inactivation, it's not the entire gene that escapes. Only the promoter escapes. The enhancers do not. And instead, the escapee promoters start having long-range contact with each other and backing each other up. So we think that might be one of the reasons for this kind of long-range megadomain structure. It's a very unusual structure. Okay. Now, this is a collaboration I should mention with the labs of Yobe Decker and Edith Hurd. And so, of course, we want to know what's the function of this boundary. So we went on to perform allele-specific deletion of that boundary and repeated uh, all the analyses. So this is indeed a boundary because if we remove it, now these two uh, megadomains no longer form. Instead, they fuse into one giant uh, long-range contact structure, into one giant uh, domain. The tabs do not come back. But instead, what is influence is the rate of facultative escape. And so that is that uh, in, in different cells, some elements always escape. That's called constitutive. Some elements only escape in some cells. And so we see a, a correlation between the frequency of 
uh, facultative escape and accessibility. And that is that, for example, in the wild type situation, we see that uh, this is the, the boundary. These are elements that escape accident activation, and they're also transcribed. Uh, in this deletion, we see that there's a lack of accessibility and also a lack of, of expression, indicating that there's now an influence, perhaps, on escape. These elements that get affected are most frequently proximal CTCF sites near promoters. So again, we think there's a role in these uh, proximal accessible sites in mediating this long-range contact. Okay. So what's happening then on this chromosome is that this active X chromosome with these lots of topological associated domains are under the influence of a long non-coding RNA exists turned into this bipartite megadomain structure with a boundary. The boundary is needed to maintain the structure. And we think there's an influence of the boundary and the structure somehow on the frequency of facultative escape. Uh, we don't know if there's actual physical contact between boundary or not, uh, but then the only parts that escape are the promoters of the escapees, which then have this unique uh, structure uh, for their continued expression. Okay, so I've told you quite a bit about the, in detail about how the DNA template reacts to this kind of epigenetic reprogramming. So now I'm gonna turn my focus to the RNA and its associated factors uh, for how this link RNA exists, this is John. So the approach we used uh, was actually very uh, similar to what I mentioned to you before, was that uh, the factors that were associated with uh, exist, again, a long, 17 kb long RNA has been under active investigation for many years, but it was a difficult problem. And so we went at it with an RNA-centric strategy using CHIRP, again, to pull down the RNA uh, from against the endogenous RNA complex and subject the complex to mass spectrometry. So as we reported last year, we discovered then that exists, this exist particle is comprised of 81 proteins, and that's assembled in a modular way. And I'll just show you some highlights of how we figure out what is the most important factor. So uh, this uh, RNA has been studied extensively in the past, so it's known that even though it's a very long RNA, there's a small region approximately 700 base pairs in the 5 prime end called the A repeat. That's absolutely necessary for silencing. And so in this A repeat mutant, the RNA can still be transcribed, still codes the entire X chromosome, but the genes don't get silenced. So there's got to be something very important on this A repeat. So we perform chirp MS on wild type exists and also the A repeat mutant. This is the scatter plot showing you, the, again, the wild type versus the mutant. You can see that everything is on the 45-degree diagonal except for three proteins whose peptide count falls to zero. Okay, so these three proteins absolutely need the A repeat for binding and hence must be uh, something important for silencing. So we've narrowed from 81 proteins down to three, much more manageable. Now we knock down each of the three proteins and we discover that this factor named SPEN was the key factor for mediating a repeat dependent uh, exist silencing. This is a factor that had never been previously implicated uh, in X inactivation, uh, but it's actually a, a, a very interesting gene. As uh, so a gene first discovered in Drosophila, uh, has the name split ends as a developmental mutant, and was later then rediscovered in human cells from biochemical approaches, identifying this protein as part of the uh, basically a co-repressor complex along with histone deacetylases, uh, part of the NERD complex. And so this protein has a very interesting structure. On the uh, N-terminal side, four professional RNA binding domains called RM repeats. On the C-terminal side, a, a Spock domain that actually recruits it into the NERD complex. We later show that the RM domains directly physically interact with the A repeat, uh, and so this is a very nice biochemical link from the link RNA to then uh, basically a repressive uh, chromatin uh, modification. To summarize what we learned about the exist particle, I just want to tell you that this is a modularly assembled and developmentally programmed complex. It's a very long RNA, but the proteins on it assemble in two steps. In embryonic stem cells, before X inactivation happens, polycomb uh, repressive group uh, one, PRC1 complex proteins already on exist, as are uh, other proteins, but parts of the complex is missing. Only with differentiation does SPEN and other factors basically get on to, uh, to the, uh, exist, and that completes the structure. And there's actually a logic to this bipartite structure, and that is that this right-hand part of the structure uh, basically is involved in maintaining the status quo. If a locus is active, it will stay active. If it's silent, it will keep it silent. What is needed to basically recreate an active 
link RNA complex was actually this uh, SPEN complex, which actually deactivates active loci. Once you deactivate the active loci, you can then put it into the status quo module and keep it in that silent state uh, in perpetuity. Okay? So there's a logic to this modularly assemble and developmentally program uh, uh, link RNA complex. So we said a lot about uh, so the proteins, but I'm drawing this RNA like a long line. Okay, is this really how it looks? And of course you know that that's not true. So I want to tell you more about really an effort to understand link RNAs really at the level we, I think of its functional meaning, and that is at the level of the RNA structure. So I think all of you know that RNA being a, you know, a single-stranded polymer can actually fold by base pairing with a cell and with other nucleic acids into very interesting and complicated structures. And so the RNA structure, the structure around the entire set of RNA structures is a long range uh, term goal uh, for many investigators. But what we know so far, at least to date, uh, has been largely what's, what can be done in vitro, often short RNAs and naked RNAs in isolation. And uh, one of the long-term goals uh, in my lab has been to get RNA structural information in living cells that are in the full length context and with R, uh, together with RNA binding proteins. I would further say that a number of the methods uh, in the recent past are, are I would characterize as one-dimensional methods. And that is that you can tell for every base whether it's single or double-stranded, but the double-stranded regions, how exactly they pair up was actually based on prediction. It's inferred. It's actually not based on experimental evidence. And so that was in this uh, sort of a shortcoming that we had hoped to solve uh, with the next sort of thing uh, advanced that I'm going to tell you. So um, I think I was very fortunate that I was trained as a dermatologist, and now I'm, I'm working on RNA biochemistry, because I knew a lot about this next chemical called sorolin. Sorolin is a very interesting chemical because it cross-links nucleic acids in a reversible manner, but also used in, actually in humans as, as a medicine. And so I'm showing you the structure of sorolin, and the chemistry is as follows. It, it, sorolin is the base intercalator, so it will inter intercalate into nucleic acids such as RNA or DNA, and with the right wavelength, they will cross-link the two strands together, like this, okay? And then with the, a different wavelength, you can actually reverse the entire process. And the structure, the preferred substrate looks like this, staggered uridines, uh, basically, which frequently occurs, of course, in nucleic acids. And so the recent method that we reported is, uh, takes advantage of this uh, technology, or this idea, and it's called sorolin analysis of RNA interaction and structure, or PARIS. It's a way to get an RNA duplex map in living cells. So here's how this works. So you start with, again with living cells, and uh, I'm going to focus your attention on these two, this red and green RNA duplex, which are going to track through the rest of the slide. We introduce sorolin uh, into living cells, and we cross-link uh, uh, with UV. Okay? So then once we trap this duplex, we can break the cell open, uh, degrade uh, the rest of the RNA, uh, get rid of it with RNAs. Then we can enrich for this duplex with an old school biochemical method called 2D gel. So in the one dimension is denaturing, and the second dimension is native. Okay? So the combination of this is that any uncross-link RNA or single stranded RNAs will basically fall apart, but the cross link RNA, doubly cross link RNAs, will run like a spider and in an off diagonal pattern, like shown like this. So, this species is something like less than 1% of the entire nucleic acid content. So, this biochemical enrichment step is quite necessary to enrich for the molecules uh, you care about. Okay? So, once we have this cross link duplex, we can basically connect the two strands together, uncross link them and then uh, go ahead and sequence. So in every sequence read, we have a single molecule evidence that these two strands of RNA were previously in a duplex together. Okay, so it's actually single molecule type evidence that we're going to be getting here. So let me show you what the data looks like. And so uh, uh, indeed we have a, a map now of the RNA structure and interaction in the living cell. This is looking at the well-known and abundant U4 and U6 RNAs, which have both intramolecular loops and intermolecular loops, so I'm showing with these arcs. Each of these arcs is supported by the primary sequence reads shown here. So each of these reads is supporting basically this structure with this structure, and this is another one shown here. If we zoom in on that, you can see that uh, basically this arm corresponds to this arm, this arm corresponds to this arm, and this tells us that these two arms were in a Watson-Crick base pair in the living cell. And we have multiple of these reads giving us confidence that this is a real uh, interaction. 
So using this technology now on Exist, which is uh, our topic of interest, we can see that this long 17 kb long RNA has a very, actually a very interesting domain structure. There are four modular domains that basically have basically folds within folds, okay, shown here. And that in addition, um, each of these, uh, I'm showing the loops in two ways. On the bottom is the arc plot that I've shown you already. On the top, these duplex spans, each of these dots indicates that this and this arm are in a duplex. So the higher the dots are, that means the longer range the interaction is. So indeed, there are actually very long range interactions, some as far away as 7 kb uh, long, the span between the duplexes. Many of you know that the softwares that people use to predict RNA structure have a window size of 200 base pairs. Okay, so they force proximal interactions. These are actually, uh, I think, computationally predicted. They're convenient, not necessarily correct. And I think we can now do a much better job using experimentally guided uh, structural data. And finally, if this map looks extremely complex, it's because it is. And there are actually alternative structures. Uh, one base involved in several different interactions. They cannot co-occur, so there's actually a family of structures. These are alternative structures. Okay, so let's zoom in on the business end of EXIST. So EXIST is comprised of a number of sequence repeats, okay? And this is now a situation where the, this kind of Paris map is really necessary. Because, for example, the A repeat gets its name because in human, there are 8.5 copies of the same sequence over and over again. So if you have a one-dimensional method, uh, each of these repeats will be computationally equivalent for your prediction as to who's going to touch whom. But in the Paris map, we can actually have a unique uh, information. So on this track, I'm showing you here the repeats. Here's the sequence conservation. I see shape is a strategy that maps single-stranded regions, and Paris maps the double-stranded regions. And the duplex pattern actually looks like this. So we actually know then exactly how each, uh, du uh, each repeat folds with the next repeat. And I'm going to summarize this complex data uh, in the following way. In, uh, in brief, uh, these repeats fold up into a, a, a kind of a module, and which is repeated. The unit looks like this. It's a staggered repeat where basically the phi prime n uh, basically, uh, do base pairs uh, with the next one. So this is the one copy, starts from here, goes over here, this is the end, this is the second copy. So the first half duplexes, the second half is single-stranded. This is a single repeat. This is the, uh, the conservation, this part is highly conserved, this is the single-stranded region. And we learned that SPEN binds actually right here, this is the, the peak of SPEN interaction. Okay, so this unique structure, it's a platform uh, for the recognition of the RNA binding protein that mediates silencing. This is the primary data indicating, uh, confirming what I just said. This is a UV cross-linking experiment showing that uh, SPEN binds exactly at these repeats, exactly at the very beginning, a little bit off to the, to the five prime end in the single stranded regions before the duplex uh, uh, regions. Okay, so I'm gonna show this to you now in cartoon form. So these um, eight, plus copy repeats folds up in a specific way. It's really like RNA origami. So repeat one folds with repeat two. Okay, like this, it's a stagger repeat. And then three, actually with five, whereas four loops over with eight, and this mandates a fold within this uh, kind of a higher order structure, and six with seven. We have four copies of this kind of a stagger repeat structure, and each spin crosslinks right here uh, there are two of these cross-linking sites uh, for where the interaction is uh, between the RNA and the protein, and there are four of these uh, in this unit, okay? So this unique fold mandated by the sequence to get into the structure uh, is the binding platform uh, for uh, this uh, long RNA silencing uh, the X chromosome, okay? In the final uh, sort of segment, I want to kind of extend on that concept and talk about how we can use our knowledge of individual examples to decode new link RNAs that might be present in evolution and in genomes that we haven't quite uh, understood. And so uh, to do that, I'm gonna turn, show you another, turn to another classic uh, link RNA uh, system, and that's actually in the dosage compensation in flies, in Drosophila. And so insect cells in Drosophila do things differently. So again, females have two X chromosomes, males have an X and a Y. And the strategy for dosage compensation is that the single X in the male is transcriptionally up-regulated by twofold, okay? This is done, again, by two long non-coding RNAs called ROX RNAs. These ROX RNAs, called ROX1 and ROX2, are both on the X chromosome. They, again, coat 
the, uh, the X chromosome, recruit chromatomodifying complexes, but this time increase transcription. So even though the two ROX RNAs are genetically redundant, okay, so if you knock out both ROX RNAs, all male flies are dead, all females are viable, very specific phenotype, the two ROX RNAs look nothing alike each other. If you take the sequence of one and run BLAST, the other one doesn't even come up in the top 100. That just shows you the difficulty, the challenge of trying to understand link RNAs using a primary sequence centric view. Okay? But we know that these RNAs actually are mapping to the X chromosome. Uh, this is the uh, uh, view by RNA, RNA in situ hybridization. They code the, uh, the chromosome. Using CHIRP, we previously mapped very high resolution the binding pattern of the ROX RNAs, uh, and you already explained the technology. Uh, so here is the track showing you the data of a CHIRP. So this is, again, uh, X chromosomes. These are the peaks of the binding of the, one of the chromatin remolent factors. Uh, this is the ROX RNA. You can see that each of these peaks is exactly at the summit of the uh, high affinity sites, uh, where are genetically defined binding sites for the ROX RNAs. The ROX RNAs only coat the X chromosome, not the autosome, so it's a very clear pattern. We carried out a lot of work on these ROX RNAs to define that, in fact, uh, the business end of the ROX RNAs is, again, a structure motif. It's a tandem structure motif that looks like this. Uh, I'll summarize the data, then I'll show you the, the, the underlying information. So it's two stem loops separated by approximately 22 ba uh, bases. Uh, these two stem loops has to be a specific sequence. The three prime arm of the stem is the binding site uh, for the key binding protein. And this spacer has to be exactly 22 nucleotides, but could be any sequence. Okay? Here's the data supporting that structure, including shape mapping the single stranded region, pa uh, pars mapping the double stranded region. This is the, uh, the structure uh, uh, conservation. You can see that this is the part that's conserved. And again, the three prime arm is where the binding happens for the key protein. So the cartoon looks like this. Okay? So what we realize is that even though this is a very long RNA, only these little bits actually really matter, okay? And so one proof of that concept is that if you look at the RNA, we can actually tell what part of the RNA matters. So we can make a mini gene that would have most of the function of the RNA. So for example, ROX1 RNA is approximately 4 KB long. But we learned that this domain, D3, approximately 400 bases, has the key stem loop features. And indeed, if we actually rescue, genetically rescue, ROX1 and ROX2 knock out flies. Remember, 100% of the males would otherwise die. This mini gene is able to rescue as well as the full length RNA. So essentially, we have now trimmed the function down to one tenth of the original size, indicating that we actually do know the functional parts of the RNA. A very talented student in the lab, Jeff Quinn, said, let's take this one step further. Can we take this knowledge and search for ROX RNA orthologs, even in species where people couldn't find them before? So the strategy is to take, uh, really, uh, again, genome sequence, always starting with the genome sequence, you, looking in syntenic regions, uh, then looking for this repeated microhomology of these repetitive elements that can form into the right RNA structure. If we see that we score that as a candidate ROX RNA, then we bootstrap from that to the next species, and so on and so forth, okay? So what's amazing is that even in these uh, uh, species where we have no sequence identity beyond background, okay, we can actually discover these link RNA orthologs, which in a moment I'll prove to you are true orthologs. So I think this really speaks to the debate about, you know, what's junk DNA, what's the information content. Just because we cannot find it by blast sequence alignment, the simple strategy, doesn't mean that there's no information. Okay. So Jeff used this strategy and basically uh, was able to go back in 40 million years of Drosophilid evolution. Uh, this is about kind of as different as kind of brown bears is to raccoons, so quite a bit of evolutionary diversity. And in fact, it's so distant that even the, the chromosome arm that's used as the X chromosome has to actually changed. So some species is Mueller element A, that's one of the chromosome arms, and the other species is actually a different Mueller element, okay? So in this analysis, Jeff was able to basically triple the number of ROX orthologs uh, in the literature by this analysis. All the ones shown in blue were basically not known in the past and discovered in this analysis. So in total, he discovered something like 43 uh, ROX RNAs, both ROX1 and ROX2. Um, what we learn is that these ROX RNAs are rapidly evolving. Some species have three ROX RNAs. Some of them only have one. And the structure was the key uh, to, to the function. 
And I'm going to show that to you by focusing on four species that span the entire uh, breadth of the evolutionary history. Drosophila monologaster, D. male, Willistoni, D. will, D. virilis, shown here. Okay. And also uh, Boschii, uh, this is the last species uh, on the left here. Okay, these two here. Okay, so one of the proofs that these are actually uh, true R RNA, rocks RNAs involved in dosage compensation is that they should bind the X chromosome. So Jeff went on to use CHIRP to map in each endogenous species the binding pattern. You can see that indeed each of these, uh, basically the rocks do always bound uh, the X chromosome, the mule element A, uh, but not uh, this species, both A and D's X chromosome, so it's binding both, but not the other autosomes. ROX1 was a very good ROX RNA in Melanogaster, but not so much in the other species. And that's quantified on the right, uh, on the left here. So Drosophila Gers Melanogaster, basically both ROX1 and ROX2 are functional, and these other species, correspondingly, the ROX1 is becoming weaker. Now, the interesting thing is that this degeneration of ROX1 was actually readily predicted from our sequence analysis of the structure. So if you look at the, the complement of these double stem loop structures, ROX1 and DMAL has three of these. These two guys have intermediate levels, have only two, and this one that's the worst now has only one left. Okay, so the complement, the dosage of the repeated structure motifs predicted the potency of the, the activity of the ROX RNA. So you might say, well, that's a very nice correlation. Prove to me that those elements are sufficient to actually do the job. So Jeff went on to actually construct synthetic link RNAs and ask, can they suffice in dosage compensation in vivo? So I mentioned to you that in Drosophila melanogaster, if you knock out both ROX RNAs, all the males are dead. If we come back with the transgene from melanogaster, we can fully rescue uh, that ef uh, effect. If we come back with the ROX from D. virilis, a different species grafted into melanogaster, we can actually also rescue quite a bit. Now, we've predicted this one is not quite as good because it only has one of these uh, stem loops. So Jeff constructed a transgene now with an extra one, and now it rescues uh, even better. So indeed, the dosage, just a single stem loop, was able to confer some level of function. So let's take this one step further. So we, we thought, OK, what if we took just a single stem loop and added it to a completely relevant RNA, let's say E. coli lac Z? And even that has a measurable rescue at, at 2%. Okay, so this is, now you might think, well, this is not very impressive, it's only 2%. What I should tell you is that this is an experiment that could only be done in Drosophila because the escape rate from this lethality phenotype is less than one in 10,000. We counted basically tens of thousands of flies who never had an escape heat. So this 2% rescue is actually something like 100-fold better than the, uh, the control, right? So we would assert that if this allele were happening in the wild, this will have a huge advantage that will quickly spread over the population. So you can even see how the ROX RNAs could evolve from these simple structural repeats being appended into a transcribed sequence. Finally, what I want to tell you about is how do these ROX RNAs target the X chromosome? If you have these new RNAs evolving, how do they find the right sites in their genome? When we did the, the CHIRP experiments, we, of course, mapped the binding site and the, the enriched motifs uh, that these RNAs would target. And we can indeed see that all these different ROX orthologs target the same sequence, this GAGA -GA repeat, very simple appearing uh, repeat. But the binding sites themselves were not always at the same location. Okay? So you can see that in this gene HDAC4, uh, in Melangaster is here, Willistoni is over here, moving around uh, over the place. This is a minority situation where the peak is always in the same location. And this top one is the frequent pattern. This is quantified here. We're looking now at a four-way comparison of these four species. Sites are in all four species, three-way, two-way, and singletons. You can see that the singletons are by far the majority. Okay? But the pattern of evolution is such that even though you don't have the, the binding site at exactly the same location, the rocks binding tend to be in the near proximity of another binding site in another species. So if there's one uh, in, let's say, DMAL, there will be another one nearby, not the exact same location. And so we think of this more, as more like cell phone towers, right? They don't have to be exactly at the same position. They just have to be in some proximity to cover the entire X chromosome. So this still leaves the question of, okay, so that these sites are moving around, how do the link RNAs target the right sites uh, in the genome? So we have a great opportunity here because of all these singletons where we know 
it's a binding site in one species, we can ask the question, what is the identity of that motif, that element, in the other species before it became, before it evolved into a rocks, a link RNA binding site? And so here, I think Jeff made a very interesting discovery. What he found was that there's actually a pre-existing element, the polypyrimidine track, that's used for splicing, that's often co-opted to become a rocks binding site as, uh, in another species. This is a sequence that that has a, uh, basically a CU-rich motif going from five prime to three prime. And what we discover is that, of course, the reverse complement could easily turn into GA, GA, GA with a slight shuffle. And this is kind of the frequency of how often these polymerating tracks in the X chromosome can turn into a rock binding site in another species. The diagnostic test for this kind of a dual function moonlighting idea is that there has to be a strand bias that basically uh, when we see an intragenic ROX binding site, they obviously have this uh, strand bias so that one strand can still serve the RNA function of CU, 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 whereas the other strand on DNA can be GA, 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 okay? So what's very elegant about the strategy is that this co-option of a splicing signal for dosage compensation automatically then targets your compensation machinery to actively transcribe genes. Right, if we have a limited amount of resource, we don't want to target it to heterochromatin, to some random location. We want to target it to transcribe genes. That's going to matter for dosage compensation. And so this system is very flexible and allows, allows the evolution of these new binding sites, but with also a very efficient targeting and parsimonious strategy. What I've told you then is that uh, there's a rapid evolution that underlies even apparently conserved an essential link RNA genome interactions. Something as fundamental as sex, which is 100% lethal without it, is still rapid evolution. So for link RNAs, it's a refinement by repetition and acquisition of these structure repeats. And on the DNA side, it's the co-option in proximity of these pre-existing signals, of pre-existing sequences that can be changed by just a slight reshuffling into a link RNA binding site. And these together then allow link RNAs to have a, this surface of this kind of plasticity uh, to basically uh, manage dosage compensation even in changing genome backgrounds, such as different chromosome arms. I'm going to end uh, by showing you this uh, sketch up by M.C. Escher, which I like very much. It shows that basically uh, coming out of this blank, blank uh, slate, two hands drawing each other. And what I've told you today is that I believe that the relationship between RNA and chromatin uh, is very, uh, has really a lot of uh, analogy. And that is that these two polymers template each other to reinforce fidelity in the transmission information. And furthermore, as so I show you that the, because the link RNA and genome can co-evolve in a rapid way, they serve as a, a mechanism for evolutionary plasticity and innovation, creating new meaning out of the blank slate of genome information. I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, many people in the lab uh, were involved in this work. I want to particularly, uh, so their names are shown here. I want to acknowledge my collaborators, Will Greenleaf, Edith Hurd, Yob Decker, and Asifa Akhtar. And I gratefully acknowledge my funding sources, especially NIH, uh, especially NHGRI, NCI, uh, and NIEHS. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for a wonderful romp through some really interesting biology. Uh, if you have questions, there are uh, microphones in the aisles. Please use those so that people watching by the video uh, can also hear the question. Uh, while people are thinking about it, I'm puzzled by your example with rocks where you're able to recreate, at least I think I understood that, the biology uh, of a link RNA with just a single short repeat. And you would think then evolution wouldn't bother to make things that are long and complicated if it could accomplish the same goal with something short and simple. But I imagine long and complicated has some benefits. Maybe you could explain. Right. So that was kind of really at the alt sort of the, uh, so what we see in the naturally occurring link RNAs is that these motifs, these structure motifs are actually repeated multiple times. Yeah. That's the case in exists. That's the case in rocks. And I think that the repeats uh, make them work uh, much better. It's so a it's a real stat, right? So the single copy was a proof of concept saying, okay, yes, it could be done, but it was very weak, uh. right? But the more copies we inserted, either in the natural existing RNAs or the ones we create synthetically, they became more potent. So you, you can dial it uh, up and down. Yeah. Over here. Hey, Howard, very nice talk. I Thank have you. two questions. So the first one is, uh, 
for the rocks story, so how the rocks will avoid the uh, autosomes because the polypinion track. And the second one probably is more philosophical. So uh, I think you show the structure is very important, but there's still some kind of a sequence uh, specificity, at least some weak sequence specificity for these long non-coding R to bind the target regions. And can you elaborate maybe the loop regions or other regions may be important to confer this kind of a sequence specificities? Sure, those are, those are really good questions. So the first question is why does the rocks go to the X chromosome? Okay, so the rocks RNAs themselves live on the X chromosome, so they're transcribed from the X. So the simplest model is that they, they just never leave, right? They're sinks of binding sites, so that's one possibility. Um, it's also known that that motif that I showed you, that GAGA motif, is a, it's, it's more enriched on the X chromosome than autosomes. So I think those two factors uh, have some contribution. The third factor is that there's actually a relationship between the three-dimensional organization of the X chromosome and kind of where the rocks tends to go. And so I think those uh, factors uh, obviously being in cyst and uh, basically preferentially loads the rocks onto the X chromosome. Uh, I think your second question is whether link RNAs have sequence specificity. I think that definitely, uh, even if it's a structure-based model, I mean, we, we need specific sequence to fall into a specific structure. So sequence is definitely important, right? Because the structure comes from, from the, the, the sequence. Uh, so it's just a matter of that, not the entire length of the, the link RNA, uh, the sequence matter, only the specific regions. I hope that answers your question. Okay, this is a little bit simpler question. At the uh, clinical level, you mentioned that autoimmunity would be more common or diseases of autoimmunity would be more common in the female. And other people have put forth that that would be perhaps due to the male fetus in a female in an intrauterine fetal maternal transfusion and there she acquires a Y chromosome in the autoimmunity that might also be a mechanism. Do you think that has something to do with what you're talking about or maybe a factor? Right. Yeah, so, so the question is, could it be a, a consequence of pregnancy, right, and especially uh, bearing a, a male fetus? Uh, well, so, so that, that is a, definitely a model that's been proffered, but I think that the, the sort of the risk ratio for, for the autoimmunity exists even if you account for pregnancy. And in fact, there's a particular syndrome called Kleinfelter syndrome, which the patients have a gene have of XXY. So they're phenotypically male, they're never gonna get pregnant, uh, but they still have the elevated risk of autoimmunity uh, because they have two X chromosomes. Uh, and so I think that's a good answer that, that that must be an independent contribution separate from pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to follow up on the question of why long non-coding RNAs are so long. So for exists, it's really quite long, right. but the A repeat is only a small portion of right. that. So if maybe you could expand upon why you think it's so long. Right. So it, it's a, uh, think of it as like a, it's a platform or like think of it like a computer circuit board where all the sort of uh, the circuits plug into it, right? So it exists, it's long, but it's also loaded up with 81 proteins. So the A-REP structure only dealt with really sort of three proteins that bind in a to repentant manner. So I think many of these other repeats could have additional, as I mentioned, this modular assembly of all these proteins. Uh, and so it's a way to basically organize a large complex and deliver it together to some location in the genome. Yeah. Well, fascinating uh, presentation and terrific discussion. We're gonna have a reception in the library. Please uh, join the speaker for coffee and cookies and continue the conversation, but let's thank Dr. Chang again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.